The next item of business is a stage one debate on motion 10795 in the name of Derek Mackay on Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, Relief from Additional Amount Scotland Bill. Could I ask any member who wishes to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons uh, now and I call on the Finance Secretary to speak to and move the motion in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is part two in this afternoon's Act, probably far more uh, consensual uh, than the previous subject. It's a shame that Mr Simpson has departed the Chamber because he's inspired the BBC to come up with uh, characterisation and images of me coming from uh, Dickens' uh, books. Hopefully I, there'll be no such uh, conjuring up of, of more uh, impressions of me in this debate because this will show what a reasonable person that the Finance Secretary is. <laughs> Just short of three years ago, the Land and Building Transaction Tax came into effect in Scotland, alongside the Scottish Landfill Tax. The first new national Scottish tax is introduced by the Scottish Parliament in more than 300 years. And subsequently, in 2016, this Parliament approved legislation to introduce the LBTT Additional Dwelling Supplement, a 3% additional rate of tax applied in relation to certain house purchases. The supplement applies where, at the end of the day, uh, that is the effective date of the transaction, a buyer owns more than one dwelling and the buyer is not replacing a main residence. Where the additional amount is paid, the legislation provides that it can be reclaimed when a main residence is being replaced and the sale of the previous main residence occurs within 18 months of the purchase of what then becomes the current main residence. The introduction of the original LBTT legislation and subsequent additional dwelling supplement were important milestones in Scotland's tax journey, but it is important to acknowledge and recognise that there will be, on occasions, a need for change. Tax is, of course, a complex, and it's inevitable that amendments will at times be required or indeed be desirable to improve operation uh, of, uh, for, for other reasons. Reflecting that fact, the Scottish approach to taxation is founded in part on effective engagement and partnership working with stakeholders. And it was as a consequence of that engagement, including with MSPs, that I introduced secondary legislation last summer to address a specific issue which had been highlighted in relation to the treatment of married couples, civil partners, of cohabitants, referred to as an economic unit in the ADS legislation. Uh, the order that was approved by this parliament in June 2017 addressed the scenario where a couple jointly buy a new main residence but only one of the couple's names was on the title deeds of their shared previous main residence. Its effects were to ensure that relevant couples either did not have to pay the additional dwelling supplement or could reclaim uh, repayment of the supplement when their previous main residence was sold within the 18-month period. Whilst the order addressed this issue for transactions occurring after it came into effect, it could not apply to transactions which occurred previously. And members of the Finance and Constitution Committee and stakeholders raised this as a concern during the scrutiny of that order, and rightly so. The Scottish Government agrees with this view and has therefore brought forward this bill to deliver parity for all taxpayers, regardless of the effective date of their transaction. It is single-minded in its focus and scope, serving solely to give retrospective effect to the provisions of the 2017 order. And I'd like to thank the Finance and Constitution Committee for the scrutiny of the bill and welcome their support for the general principles of the bill. And I recognise, of course, that stakeholders have raised a number of other issues around the additional dwelling supplement and the approach to devolve taxes more widely. I welcome their input and engagement and take seriously the points that they have raised. And I assure you all uh, that although out of the, it's out with the scope of this bill, but those issues raised in the submissions will be considered. However, many of the asks would involve a much more significant amendment to the legislation and will require further attention. On the issue of group relief specifically, I intend to bring forward a consultation on draft secondary legislation intended to address for future transactions the concerns which stakeholders have raised. And this will deliver parity of approach between LBTT and SDLT in this area. So in, of course, Murder Fraser. I'm, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way, and I, I welcome what he's just said about group reliefs. I don't know if he's familiar with the um, Law Society uh, briefing that's been issued in relation to uh, the Stage 1 debate today, but they do in that so a number of other examples of, of areas where uh, people buying houses together might inadvertently become liable to the additional dwelling supplement. And I wonder if the Scottish Government has, has any plans to look at those areas as well to see whether they require to be addressed by legislation. Cabinet Secretary. I appreciate the intervention. I don't want to give any further 
uh, views today uh, wider than the purpose of this bill and that what I've said uh, all, already. Other than to say that I'll reflect on all of those submissions and give due consideration uh, to it. I think there's a very strong argument in the Parliament, and maybe this is an issue that the Budget Process Review Group uh, ha has assisted us with. Uh, that Westminster has the ability to refine tax legislation as appropriate. We don't have that function in the Scottish Parliament, and I think there's an increasingly strong case to have such a function to address these kind of things without uh, the, the, the legislative uh, route that we otherwise uh, have to go through. So I think that's certainly worthy of uh, consideration. So in conclusion, I'm taking action on this specific technical issue as a result of that uh, uh, engagement and not least uh, from Murdo Fraser to be fair. So this bill is therefore uh, in that context non-contentious and I will hope will be supported across the chamber and across the tax community. All other considerations on land and building transaction tax will be considered in a timely and appropriate manner as part of our overall approach to the planning and management of devolved taxes. So I move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the land and buildings, transaction tax, relief from, additional amount bill, and I look forward to this afternoon's debate. And I'm very curious as to how we will fill the next 40 minutes. I call on Bruce Crawford on behalf of the Finance and Constitution Committee. How long did I get, President Officer? Five minutes, Mr. Five Crawford. minutes. Okay, thanks, President Officer. It's my pleasure to speak as the convener of the Finance and Constitution Committee. And I put on record my thanks to my fellow committee members for the constructive manner in which they went about their deliberations on the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Relief from Additional Amount Scotland Bill. I also want to thank the CLACs, particularly Alan Hunter, who supported the committee so well during our deliberations. If only uh, other aspects of the committee's workload were so straightforward to navigate. But while we're on the characters from Dickens, perhaps on this particular occasion, Derek Mackay is Samuel Pickwick, who's said to have been benevolence personified, entirely uh, a human and credible and decent and determined. As far as this bill is concerned, perhaps that's the most appropriate character from Dickens. Yeah. So I better now get on with my rest of my contribution. By way of background, following the devolution of certain powers over taxation as a result of the Scotland Act in 2012, a predecessor committee scrutinised plans to introduce the land and buildings transaction tax from April 2015. As far as the implementation of LBTT, a number of changes have been made to the Act, with perhaps the most significant being the introduction of additional dwelling supplement in April 2016. This meant that individuals or couples purchasing a second residential property would be liable to pay an additional tax charge. Exemptions, yes, were put in place to ensure that such buyers were not inadvertently left out of pocket. For example, by legislating to entitle people to claim a refund where they temporarily own two dwellings whilst waiting for their original property to be sold. However, it became apparent that the legislation had been drafted too tightly. This had the unintended consequence that couples in certain economic circumstances were treated as a single economic unit when determining whether the supplement should be levied, but not when determining whether it should be reimbursed. I know this is an issue that's been raised with MSPs across the country. To address this anomaly, the government laid a statutory instrument, which the committee considered and endorsed in June last year. At that time, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed that it was not possible for the secondary legislation to apply retrospectively, meaning that a small number of couples who'd already paid the supplement were unable to claim it back. The Cabinet Secretary undertook to consider other legislative vehicles to affect this change. The bill we are debating today is a direct result of that undertaking. Whilst the committee fully supported the policy intentions of a bill which was understandably narrow in scope, a number of additional issues were raised by stakeholders in written evidence. I now briefly address some of these comments and suggestions. A recurring point was that the data provided to Revenue Scotland did not allow it to proactively identify taxpayers eligible to claim reimbursement of the supplement. The Cabinet Secretary acknowledged this and explained that the legal world would be well aware of the bill and would raise the awareness among clients. Whilst Revenue Scotland would also publish information on its website 
to raise awareness and explain how to go about submitting a claim. However, the Cabinet Secretary accepted the fair point that attempts should be made to identify eligible taxpayers. The Committee therefore invited Revenue Scotland to consider further steps it will take to identify such people. And I'm grateful for their considered response, explaining that whilst it's not possible to do so, they intend to use a wide range of community, communication activity to raise awareness of the change. The committee is also mindful of the potential impact on the overall LBTT tax take of refunds arising from the bill. And while the impact is likely, yes, to be relatively small, we've invited the government to provide updates on the number of repayment claims made and amounts repaid. So, I put on record the committee's appreciation of the constructive engagement we've had with the Cabinet Secretary and the officials in supporting our scrutiny of the bill. I welcome the comments the Cabinet Secretary made in his opening speech and the contents of his letter of the 5th of March in response to the committee's stage one report, as well as his letter today to the committee around issues of group, group relief consultation announcement, which I, I think we would all welcome. President Officer, the committee recommends the general principles of the bill to the Parliament. Thank you very much. I now call on, on uh, Murdoch Fraser sorry, to open for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, reminding uh, members of my register of interest and that I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland. Now, uh, following on from the convener, I fear we might be in for a contest this afternoon to see who can come up with the uh, Dickens figure who the Cabinet Secretary uh, most corresponds to. I give you, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, Mr. McCauber from David Copperfield, who's described as always in debt, yet recklessly cheery and blindly optimistic. Uh, beat that if you can, uh, colleagues. Now, uh, can I, uh, on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, very much welcome the introduction at stage one of the Lands and Buildings Transaction Tax Relief from Additional Amount Scotland Bill. The Finance Secretary knows I have constituents who were caught in the very circumstances uh, that this bill attempts to redress. And uh, without giving uh, their names, it might be helpful to the Chamber if I, I narrated the circumstances of that case as an illustration of why this legislation is uh, important. In the case of my constituents, here we had a young couple who had recently married. They lived in a property which the husband had owned prior to the marriage and therefore was in his sole name. The wife did not own any property herself. In time, they decided to move to a larger property which was purchased in their joint names, as would be the normal practice. The entry date for the new property was a few weeks prior to the entry date for the sale of the existing one. Therefore, there was a short overlap, nothing unusual in that. And this led to them paying an additional dwelling supplement on the purchase price. If I recall correctly, the sum involved was in the region of £13,000, which represented a very substantial financial commitment. Nevertheless, they fully expected that this sum would be refunded to them after the sale of the first property in the normal way, as they were only second home owners on a short-term and inadvertent basis. Now, I'm sure members can imagine their, their horror when they discovered that Revenue Scotland were claiming that the additional dwelling supplement was not repayable in their case. They had never budgeted for an additional £13,000 and had no idea how they would meet this additional charge. The problem was that, as the Cabinet Secretary has pointed out, the way the original legislation was drafted, only the husband was treated as replacing a main residence. Because the wife did not have her name on the title deeds of the original property, she was not treated as replacing a main residence, and therefore, on the strict interpretation of the legislation, ADS could not be reclaimed on the sale of the first property by the husband. Now, it is quite clear that this was never the policy intent of the original legislation. ADS was introduced essentially as a revenue-raising measure to, provide, uh, to produce uh, tax from those buying a second or more properties, either for investment purposes or as a holiday home or other residence. It was never intended to be a tax on those simply replacing their main place of living. And yet, due to what is essentially an error in the way in which the original legislation was drafted, Couples such as my constituents were inadvertently caught by it. Now, I drew my constituents' case to the Finance Secretary's attention, and I'm sure other members did in similar cases, uh, and I'm pleased to see the Scottish Government 
uh, acted very swiftly. A statutory instrument was brought in last year to resolve the problem for new purchasers after June 2017. But primary legislation was required in order to give retrospective effect to those who were caught for the period from the introduction of ADS from the 1st of April 2016 until the end of June 2017, and hence we have the bill before us. It is a timely and very welcome bill and will be much appreciated by the individuals caught in the situation I have just outlined. Presenting officer, there are two other minor issues I'd like to raise in relation to the bill uh, before us. Firstly, we have to make sure that all those who would benefit from this bill are aware of its passing. This is an issue that I raised with the Cabinet Secretary when he came to the Finance and Constitution Committee, and indeed the Convener has just referred to this in his opening speech. And I think there is a particular case for Revenue Scotland to engage with the Law Society of Scotland, who may, will be best placed to be aware through their member companies of the cases affected, to ensure that everyone is aware that this legislation has been passed and those who need to reclaim ADS are able to do so. The other point relates to, to separate issues in connection with LBTT, which were raised in evidence uh, to the committee by the Law Society and the Institute of Chartered Accountants uh, in Scotland. Because there are a number of other areas where some adjustments to the LBTT ADS regime would be beneficial, for example, in relation to the transfer of investment properties uh, within pension funds or in relation to LBTT group relief, where we're dealing with uh, share pledges. Um, and I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has uh, this afternoon published a letter indicating he is prepared to consult uh, on this. And I think that is uh, something that takes us forward in a very helpful fashion. There's also been a suggestion, uh, Presiding Officer, that uh, an annual finance bill in the Scottish Parliament could be introduced dealing with the minor tidying up of matters such as this. And I think this is something that the Scottish Government should be uh, considering and would be very welcome. So in closing, uh, Presiding Officer, let me just reiterate uh, that the Scottish Conservatives will support uh, the bill uh, before us at uh, stage one uh, this evening. I hope it will become law as quickly as possible, and I know there are constituents of mine who will be very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on James Kelly to open for the Labour Party. Okay. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Presiding Officer. There's been a, a number of heated debates and exchanges uh, over the last couple of months, mainly over the, the budget. Um, certainly between myself and, and Mr Mackay, but let me make clear at the outset in terms of this debate that uh, I fully support the proposals that have been brought forward in relation to land and building transaction tax and I commend Mr Mackay for his approach in listening to stakeholders and the issue raised by committee members, principally Murdo, Murdo Fraser, and bringing forward some corrective action here. I think it's very welcome. Um, Clearly, the, the, the purpose of land and building transaction tax is to, you know, is, is to levy a tax on those who are purchasing prof property. And in setting up the original legislation, the approach that was taken was to, to basically treat uh, couples, those in civil partnerships, uh, and those cohabiting as one domestic unit. Uh, in order to, uh, to seek to ensure that, that people weren't uh, uh, participating in, in tax avoidance and that <coughs> that, that seemed a, a reasonable approach however as, as other members have outlined uh, we, we've got into a situation where if people were um, seeking to claim additional uh, c claim relief for additional dwelling supplement where they'd purchased a property and the uh, uh, sold a property in the, the previous 18 months uh, they were caught in inconsistent treatment. Um, that was unfair, and it's against the, obviously, the principles of um, fair taxation. Uh, so, uh, in addition to the changes brought forward by the order last year, uh, the bill today addresses those uh, re those caught in the retrospective nature of this uh, prior to May 2017. So that seems a, a reasonable approach. Uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that it's been well supported by uh, stakeholders who engage in this issue, including the, the, the Law Society and also those who participate in the, the relevant forum. Uh, I think in terms of the financial impact, the financial memorandum states that it, it, uh, it will have an impact of between 655,000 and 1.55 1, 1. 
uh, million pounds. Um, and although that, that is relatively small in terms of the overall budget, it will have an impact on the budget and it will be interesting to understand from the Cabinet Secretary where, where that will be uh, drawn from. Um, I think some of the, the responses that have been made uh, in relation to the consultation on this take forward other issues in terms of how uh, we could, as a parliament, better manage taxation. And I think it's right to, to look at the fact, particularly as we now have increased tax powers, we may, we may get more of these technical issues that will come up that require tidying up. And the, the idea of an annual tax bill you know, seems a reasonable one to look at where we can uh, make sure that we tidy up any unintended consequences. And summing up, um, presiding officer, um, I think this is a, a necessary measure today. I commend the work that's been done by the Finance Committee members, uh, witnesses and clerks, and I commend the Cabinet Secretary for bringing forward appropriate legislation uh, to correct this loophole and ensure that those who have been caught un unfairly by the way the original legislation was drafted can now seek appropriate redress. Thank you very much, Mr Kelly. We will now move to the open debate and I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Bill Bowman. Willie Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. I think the, the title of this bill may well prove to be almost as long as the time taken to consider and approve it. Uh, the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Relief from Additional Amount Scotland Bill, as the Cabinet Secretary Convener and members have reminded us, seeks to correct an unintended consequence of the original bill when it was introduced. The LBTT tax came in in 2015, replacing stamp duty land tax in Scotland, and it means that a percentage of the value of a house is payable in tax, and that percentage varies depending on the value of the house. The Additional Dwelling Supplement, or ADS, came in in 2016, and its purpose was to charge an additional 3% of the value of the house if it's a second home. The intention was that ADS would apply if one spouse owned an existing home and the other spouse bought a second home, but it wasn't to apply if the buyer was replacing the original house. The unintended consequence here, of course, was that the ADS was still being charged to certain couples who bought another house replacing the original because only one of their names was on the title of the first house. That wasn't the policy intention behind the ADS tax, and it is greatly important that as a parliament that we listen to how we, the well-meaning action we can take be improved and act accordingly. So this bill simply seeks to correct that and allow a retrospective claim to be made for the return of that ADS tax in those cases. So we require a new bill to correct the problem. The financial memorandum accompanying the, the short bill estimates that there is likely to be an increase of somewhere between 2 and 5% of joint buyers indicating an intention to claim the tax back, provided, of course, they are able to dispose of their original property within 18 months. On average, the value of each ADS transaction is thought to be around £8,000 or so. And overall, the cost is estimated, as James Kelly pointed out just a moment ago, to be somewhere between £600,000 and £1.5 million, and as I understand it, to be met within existing resources. So it will not involve a, a huge impact on the costs within the Scottish budget, but a very welcome measure, no doubt, for those people affected by it. In terms of the overall impact of the LBTT tax and its performance, we're seeing that over 90% of home buyers pay less tax or no tax at all compared to the predecessor stamp duty tax. And it has helped keep over 25,000 houses out of tax altogether by setting a threshold of £145,000, which means there's, there's no charge until that figure is reached. We ought to welcome the progress made through the LBTT as it involves home buyers paying a fairer amount of tax and gives them a helping hand in saving money in this regard. At the upper end of the, the market, presiding officer, data from Revenue Scotland tells us that house sales are continuing to rise annually by about 18%. And the Scottish Government is committed to monitoring the performance of the tax across all the bands. And I note from the Cabinet Secretary's announcement that the Government intends to consult on group relief, an issue that was raised by quite a number of the, the stakeholders involved. So, in summary, presiding officer, with this brief contribution, the Bill is a welcome correction to an unforeseen effect that unintentionally but unfairly taxed some house purchasers. And I'm pleased to support the motion from the Scottish Government to address this and allow those house buyers to reclaim the tax they paid on the purchase of their house.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Bill Bowman to be followed by Neil Bibby. Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I refer members to my register of interests with respect to my membership of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. And I will warn also that there will be some repetition of what others have said, I think, in, in, what, in, my, in my speech. <laughs> I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary for bringing this, this bill forward. It's both welcome and necessary. It was an anomaly in the additional dwelling supplement that saw it chargeable when spouses, civil partners and cohabitants jointly replace a home owned by just one of them. It is right now that we apply last year's action to end that anomaly retroactively. I also want to echo Murdo Fraser's point regarding advertising this change. I appreciate that Revenue Scotland cannot identify those um, those affected and will advertise the change on their website as discussed. This does not seem wholly sufficient though and I wonder if at some point the Cabinet Secretary can clarify whether any third parties such as professional bodies or estate agencies have been contacted about notifying the public more of this, of this change. As welcome as this latest fix is, it only scratches the surface. The Law Society of Scotland have highlighted several additional anomalies with ADS in their submission to the Finance Committee. One of these additional anomalies regards couples who are separating. When one partner goes on to buy a new home, relief is not available. Equally, there is no relief for couples who were not previously living together prior to purchasing a joint property. Now, neither situation seems fair, and those caught up in such cases might feel they are being penalised for circumstances that may be outside their control. Neither is it fair that the SNP's Land and Buildings Transaction Tax contains no dependent dwelling exemption as stamp duty land tax does for buyers in the rest of the UK. It is more than reasonable to consider that purchasing a property with another connected to it should be considered as an overall single transaction rather than as a purchase of an additional residence. However, we should not address these issues in isolation. The bill is, this bill is welcome, but it is narrow and cumbersome, representing a lot of time and effort in ending one relatively small but significant anomaly in a specific aspect of one particular tax. A case of deficient SNP legislation leading to a deficient fix, leading to yet another fix. A new approach is needed. And I think perhaps the Cabinet Secretary alluded to this in his, in his speech. Of course. Cabinet Secretary. Is it not fair to reflect that Parliament as a whole passed this legislation and the right thing for government to do is engage with parliamentarians and stakeholders and where possible remedy any issues that require to be remedied and to take any other course of action would have meant that there wasn't recourse and a satisfactory resolution for those that have been caught up by this which is not necessarily a matter of parliamentary fault arguably legal interpretation or enforcement whatever it happens to be surely parliament's doing the right thing this afternoon bill bowman yes, uh, thank you for that intervention yes i think parliament is doing the right thing but it's a method of dealing with um, with doing the right thing that i'm going to come on to here and ask about. Uh, Revenue Scotland could play a more prominent role in raising administrative policy changes, mirroring the relationship between HM Treasury and HMRC. Now, the, the, as mentioned, the establishment of an annual finance bill would allow this parliament a formal opportunity to review and revise tax policy, a position backed by respected bodies such as the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, the Chartered Institute of Taxation, the Scottish Property Federation, and the Law Society of Scotland. Now, surely the Finance Secretary would prefer his legacy to be that of a reforming Finance Secretary, when the time comes for a legacy, that is. <laughs> uh, the very issue we debate today demonstrates the need for a formalised review process. As the Scottish Property Federation noted, there was very little opportunity for detailed scrutiny of additional dialing supplement legislation. Perhaps a timely reminder for the SNP of the dangers of rushing legislation through this parliament only for it to come back and hit them later. An annual finance bill would signal that this parliament is serious about using its evolving tax powers in a considered and fair manner. The parliament is maturing. Its approach to tax policy must mature too. So let me finish to say that when we take decisions on how much of people's hard earned money to collect from them and how to spend it for them also, they must have confidence in our decisions. The public we serve deserve no less. Thank you.
I call on Neil Bibby to be followed by Ivan McKee. Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. I wish to record my support for this bill, uh, and I will repeat what Bill Bowman said about repeating others uh, and the likelihood of that in my uh, speech as well. The Cabinet Secretary and others uh, have set out the details of what this bill will achieve. It is, of course, unusual to introduce and pass retrospective legislation, but in this case, it's absolutely the right thing to do. It corrects an anomaly and unintended uh, unfairness introduced by uh, the Land and Building Transaction Tax Act. Uh, at, at the time, the intention of the Scottish Government was clear. It wanted to levy an additional tax on those who purchased a property in Scotland and who already owned another property. Rightly, the Scottish Government recognised that often in the purchase of a property, a situation can arise where an individual or a couple for a short period become owners, owner or owners of two properties. This is why, as has been said, a period of grace of up to 18 months was introduced, whereby if the person or couple purchasing a second property then disposed of their first property, they were able to reclaim the additional amount of LBTT which had been paid. But it has been, uh, become clear, um, as has been said, that in trying to ensure that married couples, civil partners and cohabitees do not move property between individuals for tax avoidant purposes, the anomaly or unintended consequence to which I previously referred has been created. This uh, parliament has legislated for a situation where spouses, civil partners and cohabitants are liable as would a single purchaser be for the additional taxation when jointly buying a home to replace a home that was owned by only one of them. As has been said by uh, members, they were subject to the additional dwelling supplement if only one name was listed on the deeds. But unlike a single person or a couple who were both listed as owners of the original property, those who were not listed as owners of the original property but were listed as joint owners of the new property not only became liable for the additional tax but unfairly cannot reclaim that tax if the original property is disposed of within 18 months. So it is only fair not to not just address that anomaly but for all, um, for all future purchases, but to compensate those who have been unfairly charged since the ADS mm -hmm. was introduced. Now, everyone accepts that the easiest way to address such anomalies is by the use of secondary legislation. Unfortunately, retrospective legislation cannot be affected by secondary legislation unless there is a specific express power, which in this case does not exist. Hence, this bill, which has cross-party support and the support of key stakeholders. Now, while I support this bill, I also want to highlight some of the wider concerns addressed by, to the committee by those key stakeholders. As we've heard, the Law Society of Scotland has highlighted this bill will not address other changes to LBTT, which, uh, believe, uh, which they believe it's urgently required. Uh, I accept there is no opportunity to do this here, but I hope the Cabinet Secretary will reflect on uh, what the Law Society has said and that he'll come back to, to Parliament with suggestions about how this can be looked at in the future. Presiding officer referred earlier to anomalies and unintended consequences. It is therefore worth reflecting also on another relevant issue raised by the Chartered Institute of Taxation, the Law Society, the Scottish Property Federation and the Institute of Chartered Accountants Scotland, that there should be a way of addressing technical issues that occur in our uh, new devolved tax system. Um, as James Kelly and others have said, the idea of an annual Scottish finance or tax bill is a good one. Um, and again, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary for commitment that the Scottish Government will fully consider this. Presiding officer, this, if this the Parliament decides that retrospective legislation is needed to address an anomaly, it would be pointless if the intended beneficiaries of this legislative change are unaware of the entitlement to claim a refund. I accept arguments against engaging in expensive publicity exercise on this, but I hope Revenue Scotland can bring uh, forward detailed proposals about how those affected will identif be identified and notified. As has been said as well, the legal world and the law society uh, have an important role to play here too. Those involved will inevitably have instructed a solicitor. And can I suggest that the law society be encouraged to encourage its members to identify clients who fit the relevant profile mm -hmm. in the identified time period and contact those clients to make them aware that there has been a change which could bring benefit to them. So, presiding officer, while this is an unusual bill in that it proposes to have retrospective impact, it is straightforward, has unanimous support and will address a small but significant unfairness. I therefore support the committee's recommendations that the Scottish Government's bill will be supported. And I, and I call on Ivan McKee. <clears throat> Thank you, presiding officer. And before I start, I'd just like to draw members to my uh, register of interest with respect to rental of uh, property. Um, 
I'm going to keep this very short, presiding officer, and give you some time back at the risk of repeating what everyone has said up to now and what has been an extremely uh, consensual debate. And it makes a welcome change, a bit of a respite from uh, the usual debates in this place involving matters financial and constitutional that are more akin to multi-dimensional trench warfare. Um, so it's nice this afternoon to get what is the equivalent of perhaps uh, a bit of a break to go and play football in the snow before hostilities resume again tomorrow with the uh, debate on the, uh, in, in, in the committee on the, 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 the continuity bill. So turning to, uh, to this bill itself, it obviously um, tidies up an anomaly with respect to retrospective relief. The original legislation around about additional dwelling supplement provided that couples would be treated as one economic unit um, to avoid the potential for tax avoidance uh, with individuals moving property between, between themselves. And it clearly did that, but then created this specific anomaly whereby if the old property was in the name of one of the individuals um, and the new property was in both names, then they fell liable for, uh, for the tax, effectively treating them as one economic unit where ADS was payable, but not when, uh, when the ADS was being, it was being repaid. Um, so it's welcome to see that the government has listened to the concerns that have been raised and the Cabinet Secretary has brought forward this bill to, uh, to address that anomaly. The total tax reclaim, as has been mentioned by Mr Kelly, comes to somewhere, estimates vary between £650,000 and £1.5 million approximately, which clearly isn't a significant number in the scope of the, uh, the government's finances. <laughs> but as, um, as mentioned by Mr Fraser, for individuals concerned, this could be a significant... Um, amount of money and they'll be very, very glad to, uh, to see that coming, coming back to them themselves. Clearly other issues have been raised through the scope of the, the consideration of the bill and these have been mentioned. It's good to see that group relief is, uh, is having some, uh, some consideration by the Cabinet Secretary with the, the opening of a consultation on that matter and other anomalies raised by the Law Society hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll get some, uh, some review as well. Um, of course I will. Bruce Crawford. I wonder, would the member agree with me in, in, in regard to an annual finance or tax bill that perhaps Bill Bowman should go off and read the Budget Process Review Group, which covered this area quite extensively and, in fact, recommended to the, the government that examined the need for finance bill and brings forward any recommendation by the end of the current session. Indeed, the Cabinet Secretary responded quite positively to that suggestion. Ivan McKee. That, that was exactly the next point on my, my list of points here. I think that the finance bill would be, uh, would be something that would be um, very welcome to be considered. And let's see if that uh, is that something that's possible. And it's, it's a shame Mr Bowman didn't get the memo about the suspension of hostilities with remarks, remarks earlier. Um, so in conclusion, presiding officer, just to say that um, it's great to see the government listen to this issue. They've taken it on board and they brought forward uh, the, the required changes to make this, uh, to make this effective. Um, the, the committee, Finance and Constitution Committee in its entirety, welcomes the bill. Um, there's consensual support for it, um, and we're glad to see the bill passed in due course. And thank you. Thank you very much. And we turn to closing speeches, and it's James Kelly to close for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, you know, Bill Bowman and Neil Bibby uh, both commented that they, and so did Ivan McKee, were concerned that they might be repeating some of the points that others have made. Uh, feel a bit of sympathy for those of us who have got to speak twice in this debate. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a, a real danger that we could be, we could be uh, appearing on UK gold soon. Um, so uh, anyway, obviously there's been a strong element of consensus uh, in this debate, which is right because the, the anomaly in the original legislation is being corrected by the legislation that's been brought forward by the Cabinet Secretary and those who have been unfairly affected, uh, if this goes through, will be able to claim appropriate retrospective relief. I think in terms of some of the issues that have come up, people have raised uh, the, the, the issues brought up in, in other responses from the Law Society and other uh, organisations uh, in looking to try and extend out the areas covered by this legislation in terms of like group re relief and uh, Bill Bowman gave the example of couples that have been separated and I think that should be looked at seriously. Uh, however, the, the should be, I, would, I would give an element of caution. Ultimately, this is a, a tax raising measure um, and ta tax has got to be raised fairly, um, you know, and if there are unfairnesses in the system, uh, uh, 
I, I expect those to be ironed out. However, uh, we don't want to get into a situation where we build in so many exemptions that we lose the effectiveness of the tax raising measure, which is ultimately to contribute towards the, the, the budget, which everyone feels so strongly about, no matter what their, their, their uh, point of view on it is. Um, in terms of the, the awareness campaign, this was something that Murdo Fraser uh, raised at um, committee. Uh, and I appreciate that this is you know, p potentially difficult because looking at the analysis, um, I think it potentially only affects between 76 and 189 people um, potentially. So it's quite a small number. So I can understand the caution from the cabinet secretary in terms of Revenue Scotland or anyone else launching a, a kind of major advertising campaign. Um, I suppose what needs to be done, what, what's needed is some innovation there, you know, and that a lot of these bodies will know the particular individuals who may be affected by this and can, can communicate to them. I think also social media can, could be used quite skillfully. Um, those of us uh, who use it as part of our political campaigning are well aware that, you know, certainly if you look at Facebook, you can put a small money, bit of money behind Facebook advertising and that can reach a, a wide audience. So that potentially might be something for Revenue Scotland to, to look at. Um, I think the, the other main point that came out at the debate, in the debate that I raised in my original contribution, Neil Bibby underlined it was perhaps a need for an annual finance bill to deal with you know, technical tax changes. I, I think that makes good sense. But overall, it's been a consensual end to the afternoon, if it wasn't a consensual start to the afternoon. Uh, and uh, certainly from these benches, we support the government's approach in this. Thank you very much. And I call on Alexander Burnett to wind up for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would firstly like to extend my thanks to my fellow committee members uh, for the constructive conversations we've had on this bill and look forward to continuing our work with them as we scrutinise this piece of legislation. Uh, in addition, I would like to echo the thanks of our convener, uh, which have been extended to our clerks and to those who have submitted evidence to the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, before I continue, I'd like to note members to my register of interest, particularly the businesses I own, which deal with the purchasing and leasing of residential properties and businesses and are impacted by LBTT. <coughs> now, turning to the bill itself, the Scottish Conservatives agree with and welcome its introduction at stage one. As many have pointed out today, the need for this bill is that it's is the consequence and another example of an SNP government pushing through bad legislation, requiring further legislation to correct. And the irony of this, as we argue over the timings proposed by the SNP for the continuity bill, makes it particularly topical. And it would appear from evidence taken that this will not be the last piece of correcting legislation required. As my colleague Murdo Fraser noted, this legislation is required to correct the injustice brought on many constituents who are simply starting a home together. And as has been pointed out, many experts noted during discussions over previous legislation that they had grave concerns over the impact of a bill on the housing market and other potential consequences. And these concerns have been borne out by facts. The estate agent, Aberdeen Considine's own analysis last December which showed that selling prices in Glasgow's East End had risen by 20% in the last quarter. And as the Times reported just last Friday, it has led to first-time buyers without the extra capital being consistently outbid by buy-to-let investors from China and the Middle East. Now, whilst not wanting to deter international investment, legislation brought in by this Scottish Government should not be to the detriment of our own residents looking to make a life and home of their own. But this bill also brings forward the opportunity to consider the wider issues that we face with LBTT. And the Law Society noted that there will continue to be regular issues that arise in relation to the implementation of devolved taxes, and therefore that they would encourage Revenue Scotland and the Scottish Government to work together in a, public, in a policy partnership to ensure that the Scottish tax system is responsive and fit for purpose as it develops. And as stated by the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland, there is a good case to be made for care and maintenance measures in the existing tax law, so that if stakeholders find parts of the legislation do not work as intended, 
there is an opportunity to revisit the law without the need for primary legislation. And I note and welcome the Cabinet Secretary's letter to the Committee shortly before the debate, introducing a consultation on group reliefs and hope he will continue to be as receptive to other issues. So in conclusion, we have a duty to pass bills here that work effectively and benefit our constituents to the maximum effect the first time round. So whilst we support the consensus in passing this bill to the next stage, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to cover in his closing remarks what his response is to the further amendments to the land and buildings transaction tax legislation that the Law Society and others have raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary of Finance to conclude the debate. Until about five. Uh, yes. Presiding officer, thank you very much. I'll do so very briefly by answering a number of points who, uh, that, that have been raised. Uh, in terms of finance, I imagine within all the devolved taxes that the scale of the financial issue here is not of a scale that would give me any cause for concern. But whilst Revenue Scotland can't proactively pursue those who they think might be eligible for that refund, in a sense, certainly the uh, raising awareness of the issue and the uh, solicitors and others, they can proactively go back to their clients, hopefully will provide redress to people. And I suppose Myrtle Fraser, like many MSPs, will enjoy writing a letter to constituents to say, see that £13,000 bill that you were taxed with? Well, because of the consensus in Parliament, you're now no longer liable for that and can reclaim that back. What a dream for a Tory to write such a letter. But in fact, any member who's had such a case raised uh, can write back in those terms. So MSPs have a responsibility as well. But in all seriousness, I appreciate the tone of the debate, uh, the constructive suggestions in supporting the action that will be taken to ensure that we can address this issue. Having addressed it through the order, we can also address retrospectively uh, as well. Uh, I don't often hear the words from James Kelly that I commend Derek Mackay. Uh, but I liked it and hope we can hear uh, more of that uh, in future. And on that note, more than just this issue, if there is indeed parliamentary consensus that what we require is an annual finance bill to address some of the month-to-month -month or year-to-year -year finance issues, uh, then I think that will be welcome. But the Finance Committee convener is absolutely right. Bruce Crawford was absolutely right. But it was a recommendation coming from the Budget Process Review Group and something that I certainly welcome. But it's a further welcome that uh, parties across the chamber uh, are agreed uh, on that point, including the mild-mannered Bill Bowman. Uh, in reference to some of the specific issues raised around why it doesn't capture every issue that's raised through the consultation, we also want to be very careful around tax avoidance and some deliberate behaviours to avoid paying tax. So in whatever we do, yes, we engage, yes, we consult, but there was a clear reason to proceed with this bill and this very focused piece of legislation to address that anomaly. Now, I think that the Parliament gave it due attention at the time, but sometimes there will be unforeseen consequences from legislation and its interpretation and enactment. And Parliament, of course, should have the right to return to that and address that. And also opposition parties being mature enough to welcome uh, the remedies when they have been found and found so swiftly and in a fashion of consensus and constructive approach as well. So again, from the committee, from stakeholders, I appreciate the response on this. And of course, we'll return to the other matters uh, that have been raised through the course of the uh, consultation. Uh, the financial consequences have been set out. The number of people affected is quite uh, small, but significant for those people. And that's why that we uh, remedy this today. And I look forward to doing so in just a few seconds' time. Uh, this is only stage one. Uh, presiding officer, I look forward to the further stages of this debate and the recommendation of cross-party appeal to have yet another finance debate in the Scottish Parliament following on from the budget debates that we've had over the course of the last few months. But I'm happy to move uh, this uh, bill this afternoon. Thank you very much. And that concludes our stage one debate. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of motion 10654 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary on a financial resolution for the land and buildings transaction tax relief from additional amount Scotland bill. Could I call on Derek Mackay to 
Move that motion. Moved. Thank you very much. The next item is consideration of business motion 10843 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revised business programme. Uh, could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10843? Formally moved. Thank you very much. Can I ask if any member wishes to speak against the motion? No, the question therefore is that motion 10843 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 10844 on stage two proceedings on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 10844. Moved. Thank you very much. We come now to decision time. The first question is that motion 10794, in the name of Derek Mackay, on the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2018, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10794 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes, 93, no, 23. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 10795 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Relief from Additional Amount Scotland Bill at stage one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The next question is that motion 10654 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution for the LBTT relief from additional amounts Scotland bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final motion question is that motion 10844 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on stage two of the UK withdrawal from the European Union legal continuity Scotland bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll move to members' business in the name of Marie Goujon on the leader programme. And we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change their seats. <laughs>